Unleavened Bread Ministries presents from your hands, your feet Unleavened Bread stand. Bible Studies with Jesus David Eels. What can quench my thirsting soul? Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. Greetings, saints. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. As you know, we've been studying my brother's keeper and um, finding out our responsibilities towards God's children. And uh, let's pray and ask the Lord's grace upon us. Uh, Father, Father, we know how much you love your children. Sometimes we forget that you live in them. And uh, we ask you to have mercy upon us and give us wisdom and give us a heart for your children, Lord, the way you do. And um, Father, pour out your mercy upon us, your wisdom upon us. Cause us to see and remember these scriptures that you're teaching us concerning the judgment and um, how that uh, treating your children is uh, the way we treat you, Lord. And uh, we certainly want to treat you the very best and most respect, Father, but sometimes we don't. But um, give us your grace, Lord. Give us your grace to see the way you see and uh, react the way you react. And uh, thank you, Father, for your mercy towards us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, we studied... Um, parable of Matthew 25 on the judgment just a little bit. I'd like to back up and get the text a little bit. There's before the parable on the judgment of the nations, there's a parable of the talents. And I just want to, I'm not going to read it. I just want to briefly remind you of something there. We know in verse 14, it says, it says, when a man going into another country called his own servants. Uh, you'd be surprised how many uh, of the Christian religions believe that the Lord was talking about the world here instead of his own servants, which is what it says. Um, it, it makes them feel better to believe that God's going to judge the world and not them, you know, because they're eternally secure or some reason like that, you know. Um, but this is talking about the Lord's servants. The Bible doesn't call the world the Lord's servants. Um, he called his own servants, and he delivered unto them his goods. And what what gifts has God given unto his people, you know, to to use for his glory and for his kingdom until his return, right? Verse 15 says, And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, uh, to each according to his several ability. So, God gave talents. I don't think it's an accident that that word is being used. We know it really is talking about money, but it's also uh, some valuable gift that he has given that he expects fruit from when he returns. So, um, but to us, talent is uh, some gift that God has given to us, some talent that he's given to us to serve his people. You know, we're the body of Christ. And, um, severally members thereof every member's purpose is to serve the rest of the body but that's gets kind of lost in churchianity nowadays because it's pretty much go edify yourself and go home you know but the truth is we've been given a gift to edify the rest of the body of christ and the lord when he returns obviously he received fruit from the person that he gave the five talents and the two talents he received back fruit from that and he said well done good servant enter thou into the joys of the lord you know he rewarded them because they brought forth what he put in they brought forth the fruit of what he put in and it was according to their ability that he gave them these gifts you see i mean we are able to do what god gives us to do we are able to use his gifts he has given us the word which is a which is uh, able to give us the faith 
that we need uh, to do what he's called us to do. And as you know, most of you anyway, um, the one, the guy with the one talent uh, did not bring forth any fruit, and he became what the Lord called an unprofitable servant cast forth into outer darkness. God had given him a gift. He had given him a talent, and he buried it in the earth. And I would say that's pretty common among Christians is to um, give that which has been given to edify the kingdom uh, to the earth. And, you know, the earth represents the flesh. You know, uh, this old, old flesh was um, created from the dust of the earth. And um, I think that many people use their talent for the earth, for the fleshly, to gratify self. And, of course, it's not bearing the kind of fruit that the Lord expects when he returns. And we know that fruit is Jesus Christ. You know, uh, fruit is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you want to look at someone who is saved and bearing all the fruit and filled with the Spirit, you look at Jesus. He's our example, right? And um, so God's expecting something from us. And, and with this in mind, we read last time um, 31 on down, which is the parable of the judgment of the nations. We discovered that also that he's not judging nations. He's n judging nations of people. You'd be surprised how many people out there believe he's talking about judging wholesale nations. Well, they're trying to get out of something. <laughs> they're trying to get out of um, the conviction that the Lord would put upon them by reading this and understanding that we're called to treat God's children right. We're called to meet their needs. We are our brother's keeper. And, um, you know, he talked about here the Lord returning, uh, sitting upon the throne of the kingdom, uh, separating the sheep from the goats. And let me read this part again here, uh, verse 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you visited me. And I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, and fed thee, or a thirst, and gave thee drink? And when saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? And when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it unto thee, these my brethren, even these least, you did it unto me. And then he shall say unto them, On the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire. Because obviously they did none of these things. They didn't provide the needs of the brethren. In which case, they're not providing the needs of the body of Christ. They're not providing the needs of God himself in his people. Um, we kind of went on the physical route last time concerning not meeting the needs as far as uh, feeding uh, God's children or um, giving them to drink or taking them in as strangers or clothing their nakedness or sick or, or being in prison. We went down the physical route. But I want to point out to you that there's a spiritual route for every one of these. And, um, you know, we have a responsibility to meet the spiritual needs of the brethren around us. We are a body, and every part of the body serves the rest of the body, and the body is, is the body of Christ, right? When he said, uh, for I was hungry, and 
uh, you gave me to eat. Obviously, there are baby Christians or, or let me say even people that have not yet come into Christianity because let me point something out to you. Um, if you are a son of God or a child of God, you were from the foundation of the world according to the scriptures. It just in time, there came a moment when you manifested what was given to you from the foundation of the world. The Bible says he chose us in him from the foundation of the world. And Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So, you know, um, as far as God's concerned, he sees the end from the beginning. He knows his sons out there. He knows some of them haven't yet come into the kingdom. But he also knows it's our job as the body to uh, fulfill the Great Commission, which he commanded us. And, um, you know, some people aren't physically hungry, but they are starving to death for the Word of God. And um, it is our responsibility as um, individually ministers of his to uh, do the work of an evangelist, to uh, share what we know with people around us, to share in some kind of a way uh, to meet the needs of the people who are hungry, starving for the word, dying without it. Um, and he says, and I was thirsty and you gave me drink, you know. The Bible speaks of hungering and thirsting after righteousness, right? And uh, what did he say? They will be filled. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. So you see there's a spiritual application here. It just so happens for every one of these there's a spiritual application. Because we're not just um, flesh. We're not just a body. We're a, a spirit and a soul and a body. And... Um, Meeting the needs of the rest of the body is what God has called us to do. And the last time we discovered that, that God wanted some equality, he demanded equality in the church as far as meeting people's needs. And he demanded, too, that if we were going to be his disciples, we would have to renounce ownership of everything we have. All right? Whosoever be of you that renounceth not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. All that he hath, that covers... Not only physical, but spiritual things, you see. We don't own. We are not our own. We were bought with a price, the Bible says. We do not own anything. We are now stewards in the New Testament. Meaning we are handling these things for our Lord. They belong to Him, right? And so, He is one that commanded us, you know, in the Great Commission to go into all the world, right? Right? and to share the gospel. And, and, you know, I know we all may serve in different capacities to do that. Some preach, some um, help others to do it, some support others to do it, some pray, some uh, give their funds, some, you know, just so many different ways that God does this. But the body works together to uh, bring in the strangers, let me say. You know, the next part here is... And, uh, I was a stranger and you took me in. You know, when are, when are these people strangers? Is when they haven't come into the kingdom yet, you know. And um, it, uh, we were talking recently, in fact, just before this, this uh, uh, program, about the suffering Christians in Iraq, you know, how that uh, many of them are really starving to death. There's a kind of a revival going on over there, but there's not much food being fed, you know, in the places that they're trapped and the churches that they're trapped in. And um, folks, God's putting it into some of his children's heart to spread the word, you know, uh, by some by TV, some by foot, some by satellite, somebody, you know, different methods. He is putting it in the heart. He is going to have a great revival. He is going to get the food to the people that need it. And I encourage you to pray for that. Pray that the Lord of the harvest sends laborers into his harvest, right? I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. You know, the Bible says in Romans 13, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Why do we put on Christ? We put on his works, don't we? Yes, uh, the, the, the bright 
garment of the bride in Revelation 19 is, quote, the righteous acts of the saints. We put on the works of Jesus. We put on the life and actions of Jesus. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And, of course, we are able to, by the grace of God, enable other people to be putting on Jesus Christ to by sharing with them the good news, by sharing with them the methods of God, by sharing with them the uh, provision through Jesus Christ. We're able to help them. For teaching them how to put on their armor, so on and so forth, we're able to help them to um, get dressed up and not be found naked. Being found naked, as the Scripture calls it, is uh, to be found in your sins not to have been put on the life, nature, and works of Jesus Christ, right? And naked, and you clothed me, and I was sick, and you visited me, and I was in prison, and you came unto me. So, you know, there are many sick folks that the Lord, but that physically and spiritually, that the Lord wants us to go to. We have the answers. We who are Christians who love the Word of God and put it in our heart, we have the answers, and God makes us responsible. It's a talent that God has given unto us, and he wants it to bear fruit in other people's lives and in our own life, right? And in prison, you know, Jesus came in Isaiah 61 to set the captives free and to open the prison to them that were bound. And, of course, he's not talking about a physical prison there. He's talking about a spiritual prison. But in this text, I believe it's probably both, you know, Um because many of God's people will be imprisoned in the days to come and for any kind of reason that they can think up to put somebody away. But uh, also, so many of God's people, or even the people of the world who are ultimately to become God's people, are in prison. And, um, you know, we have the gift to set the captives free. We have the gift of God. We have the talent of God to meet their needs. You know, we're not in this life just to please ourselves, just to have a comfortable Sunday sermon and go home and, and uh, take a nap and uh, get up and watch the football game. And this is, this is not Christianity, folks. We are here to lose our life. We are here to sacrifice our life, especially for the needs of the brethren. It's very important. Obviously, the people that didn't do these things the Bible's very plain, verse 46, These shall go away unto eternal punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. Whoa, that's pretty important. Now, you don't hear many, you don't hear a lot of sermons on this. There's lots of sermons on what you must do to be saved, but obviously here the Lord is judging because of the way God's people treat one another. Well, we are our brother's keeper. We have the ability, we have the talent from God to do this in different forms, in different people, different gifts. I, I agree, but if you do something with what God has given you, then um, you're going to be a profitable servant, not an unprofitable servant cast forth into outer darkness, as the Scripture says here very plainly. You know, Jesus said, He that gathereth not with me scattereth. You know, he was the one who bound the strong man and commanded us to gather and uh, plunder his kingdom. And he said, if you didn't, you will scatter. The Lord will permit the forces of darkness to give you more trouble than you know what to do with, you know. I mean, we are here to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? And that's not just the kingdom in us, but it is in meeting the needs of the brethren too around us. You know, we, we wash the disciples' feet, so to speak. It's a spiritual Meaning, it's not physical. It means, of course, that um, you clean the dirt from his walk, right? You sanctify him. You separate him from the world, right? We are called to be our brother's keeper in so many ways, you know. And, uh, you know, Jesus said the good shepherd um, lays down his life for the sheep. And... Um, He's our example, not just for shepherds, but for everybody. Let me read this to you. Um, verse 11, John 10, 11. 
I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd give, layeth down his life for the sheep. He that's a hireling and not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, beholdeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf snatcheth them, and scattereth them. He fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, I know mine own, and mine own know me, even as the Father knoweth me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Well, any shepherd that is an under-shepherd, let me say, of the Lord Jesus Christ, or one in whom the Lord is shepherding his sheep, um, uh, will be laying down their life. They won't be living the high life contrary to the example laid down by Jesus and his disciples. They won't be doing it, folks. Um, these people are not shepherds. They're hirelings. They're in it for the gain. They have buried their talent in the earth, so to speak, spiritually seen, and uh, because they love the things of the world and they give in to their flesh and they feed their flesh. They use their talent to feed their flesh and uh, bury it in the earth, so to speak. But the Lord laid down his life. He gave up everything. This was his only hobby. This was, to him was the most important thing, was the sheep. And uh, boy, I tell you, that kind of devotion we just don't see in apostate Christianity these days, you know. But this is what God expects. If you're the good shepherd, if you are one in whom the good shepherd lives, then you will lay down your life for the sheep too. He goes on to say, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Notice he said he had them before they'd ever been saved. You know, now the parable that we just read in Matthew 25 makes a lot of sense, you know, because he said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. In other words, they haven't come yet. And they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock and one shepherd. They shall become, you see. So he counts these sheep as his. He counts these as his brothers and sisters, as his children, and um, they will come into the kingdom. Jesus said, all that the Father giveth me shall come unto me. That's what he said. He didn't say they'd all stay. They won't, but all that the Father giveth him shall come unto him. And verse 17, Therefore doth the Father love me, because I lay down my life. This is what the Father loves about a shepherd who will lay down his life, or anybody else, for that matter. Um, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. Obviously, that's what we do, right? We're laying down our life, that we might have resurrection life, and take it again, right? And... Uh, but also, in, um, in 1 John, we're told in chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Hereby know we love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Notice, the reason Jesus laid down his life is so we could lay down our life. Not so we could have a cushy life in the world and feed the flesh and, um, and uh, get totally um, spoiled, uh, but so that we could serve the brethren, you know. In verse 17, But whoso hath the world's goods, and beholdeth his brother in need, and shutteth up his compassion from him, how doth the love of God abide in him? You know? We see our brothers in need, folks. They're in need of everything that we mentioned over here in Matthew. They're in great need of all the things. They're in need of um, food and water, and uh, they're strangers, and they need a place to stay, right? And they're, they're naked and in prison and sick and so on and so forth. We're in need. They're in need of these things, and we have to give to them. And yet some people are gorging themselves on the th blessings of God, Bearing it in the earth and otherwise, and not taking care of the Lord's brethren, and uh, and whatsoever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. The Lord says, "This is how we are treating the Lord." You see, I'll read this again. 
He says, Hereby know we love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is expected of us, to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is the crucified life. This is the self-denying life, right? Uh, but whoso hath the world's goods, and beholdeth his brother in need, and shutteth up his compassion from him, how doth the love of God abide in him? Remember, again, we're talking about, we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that the Lord demanded equality among his people. He wants everybody's needs met. He that had little had no lack, and he, he that uh, had much had nothing over, meaning we don't need more than we need, right? And so God demanded equality. He demanded sacrifice from his people. We are called to be our brother's keeper. We're called to meet the needs. Many people are serving themselves, serving their own house, serving their religious house, but they're not serving the Lord's house, and they're not building the Lord's house, not, not building the Lord's kingdom. But we're called to do this. You know, Haggai is an awesome example of this. Let's go to Haggai. Here's a story that um, has fulfillment in these end times. It's going to start soon. And we have the timing right here in the text of when this is going to start in the end times. You know, the things that happen unto them are for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so here it is again. Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1, I believe, begins the tribulation period. I'll tell you why in just a minute. He says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, um, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So the word of the Lord came through Haggai to these two men. And uh, we already know who these two men represent. They represent the two witnesses. And the reason is we, you can usually flip over a page there and come to Zechariah chapter 4, and you see in verse 11, for instance, it's in several places here, but I'm just picking this one. He says, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these? Two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof. So two olive trees. And then if you go down to verse 14, you see, um, Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Well, that's a quote out of Revelation chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 11 and verse 4, and it says, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the Lord of the earth. Almost a quote there. And, and who are these? Verse 3, And I will give unto my two witnesses. So you see, Joshua and Zerubbabel represent the two witnesses, okay? And so we see the two witnesses being addressed by the word of the Lord through Haggai. Haggai represents the man-child ministry, which is about to come on the scene just like Jesus did at the beginning of their tribulation, their first three and a half years, right? And um, here we see that um, we're seeing a type and a shadow of that. Because down through here several times, the Lord gives instruction and direction through Haggai to Joshua and Zerubbabel. Okay? Joshua and Zerubbabel are two other types of the two witnesses. And um, so let's read on here. Let's see what we can see. Matter of fact, if you read this whole chapter, it, you, it starts, I believe, at the beginning of the tribulation period, like Jesus raised up the two witnesses. Uh, the disciples that he sent out two by two, they were two corporate witnesses. Jesus, the man-child, raised them up. And now we know that the same thing's about to happen in, in, um, in the tribulation period, a, a repetition of those things, the things that have been or the things that shall be, the things that have been done or the things that shall be done. 
And uh, that's what this whole story is about, raising up God's temple. Okay? And if you look at the second to last verse in this text, it says, for instance, that everyone, um, let's see, I'm going to read verse 22, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Now you recognize that, how that they kill each other off. That happens at the Battle of Armageddon. And um, so you see, we started at the beginning of the tribulation, and we end at the Battle of Armageddon in the great and terrible day of the Lord. So let me go back now to verse 2, and we'll read on, see what else we can see about building God's house, building God's temple. You know, um, in verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, It's not the time for us to come, the time for the Lord's house to be built. Well, that was just an excuse, wasn't it? The Lord didn't agree with them. Verse 3, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your sealed houses while this house, house lieth waste? Now, that house was the temple, right? The temple of God. Now, who is the temple of God? You know, we're told in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, you know, that, um, that we are the temple of God. Know ye not that ye are a temple of the Holy Spirit, it says there? And so when you're talking about building the temple of God, you're talking about building God's people. And so, you know, instead of building God's people into God's kingdom, um, the Lord was complaining here that they were building their own house, right? Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your sealed houses while this house lieth waste? Now, the house he's talking about is the house of the Lord, the people of God, okay? So what other house could be being built in these days besides physical houses? Obviously, God's people who don't believe in equality, uh, who don't believe in meeting one another's needs, um, can build some pretty nice houses, physically speaking, and I'm sure that that could be applied to that, but it also means uh, the houses of worship, men building their own houses, you know, instead of God's house. We know the only material God's house can be built out of is the saints and the Word of God, right? So let's read on here. He says, Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. That's interesting. He's describing the curse here. You know, the curse that comes upon God's people when they don't seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus said, all these things will be added unto you if you do that first, you know. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know what people have gotten used to as normal is the curse. And here we are at the beginning of the tribulation when the Lord is raising up the two witnesses by the word of the Lord, and God is anointing them. And guess what God's people are doing? They're building their own houses. They're not building the house of the Lord. They're not building the people of God. They're not meeting their brother's needs as far as hungering and thirsting and uh, prison and uh, so on and so forth, uh, bringing in the stranger from outside. They're not building God's house. You know? They're building their own houses. And what do people see as normal Christianity nowadays? It's pretty comfortable life. No sacrifice. You know, pretty much uh, doing what you want to do. You go and, you know, appease God a little bit on Sunday, and the rest of the week you do what you want to do, right? No, no idea that the Lord has actually called you to serve his body in one form or another. He's called you to serve his body. 
And of course, these people are, you know, earning wages to put them into a bag with holes in it, right? And verse 7 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. The mountain here, I believe, is the kingdom of God. The mountain of the kingdom of God. The mountain that the stone rolled down out of in Daniel that smote the image of the beast in the feet and destroyed that image. That's the kingdom of God, right? So go climb the mountain. Build the house. His house is only going to be built on the top of that mountain. It can't be built on, on men's mountains or it can't be milt, built in, on, in men's methods, right? His men's word, men's doctrines, it can't be built by any of those things. Because if you're doing those things, you're just building your own house, not God's. If it doesn't look like the Christianity you read about in the Bible, then guess what? You're not building God's house. You're building your house, right? And I will um, take pleasure in it, he says. And I will be glorified, says the Lord. That's the Great Commission, folks. We're called to build God's house. The Great Commission is to bring in the people, to feed the people, to meet their needs, to make them able members of the body, right? Verse 9. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house that lieth waste while you run every man to his own house. Well, you know, other than meeting personal selfish needs daily, weekly, yearly, um, God is calling us to sacrifice our life and to serve the brethren. Uh, Jesus said, I laid down my life. The Bible says, if he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We're called here to lay down our lives. This is God's calling. No, normal Christianity is not normal for Christianity. So he says, verse 10, Therefore, for your sake, the heavens withhold the dew, and the earth withhold us its fruit. The Lord is chastening us. God is bringing his people through chastening because they're not doing the Great Commission. They're not doing what they're called to do, right? We need to repent, folks. We need to turn to God. We need to sacrifice our life, right? And I call for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the grain and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Well, they're not seeking first the kingdom, right? We need desperately to seek first God's kingdom. That's not just in our life. It's in the life of the people around us. We're called to do that. The Lord said if you'd do that, he would meet all of your needs. That's what he said. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. You'll meet all of your needs. You won't have to seek after your needs. You seek after his kingdom. If you seek after his kingdom, he seeks after your needs, right? If you seek to, to uh, meet the needs of the brethren or the people in the world that are called to be the brethren, then God will see to your needs while you're doing that. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. That's the man-child and the two witnesses, right? Along with the remnant of the people. That's what you saw in Jesus' day in the Gospels, right? Jesus raising up the two witnesses to raise up the remnant of the people. Same in this, these days, folks, except it's going to be worldwide. It's going to be the same thing, right? And um, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Jehoshua, uh, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. 
In other words, ooh, God is going to have a revival here, and he, people are going to suddenly realize what we are called to Christians for. And um, we're going to begin to use those talents that the Lord has given us, right? Not everyone, but many will. And verse 15, in the, the fourth and twentieth day of the month, in the sixth month, on the second year of Darius the king. Then he goes on to exhort um, them to uh, build the house. Um, Joshua, Zerubbabel, the remnant of the people, in verse 2, to build the house. And uh, to be strong and to uh, finish the work. And um, verse 6, I believe, is one of the reasons God's people are now taking him seriously. It says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. And the precious things of all nations, or I should say the desire of all nations, things wasn't in the original, but precious and desire is the same word. The desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Isn't that neat? Well, you know, there's some disagreement over what the desire of the nations is, but um, I think there's two possibilities, and both of them fit in one way or another, and that is the people of God, the elect of God, who are coming out of all nations who are desired of God are coming to his temple. That's one. And the other one is, of course, the Lord himself coming to his temple and filling those people who are the temple with himself and his glory. You say, could it be both? I very well could be because both fit very neatly, you know. Uh, matter of fact, you know, when he shakes all nations, he says the, the desire of all nations shall come and will fill this house with glory. And I'm reminded of what Hosea uh, chapter 11 and verse 10 and 11 says. It says, They shall walk after the Lord who will roar like a lion. Listen to this. For he will roar and the children shall come trembling from the west. The Lord's judgment, the threat of the Lord's judgment coming upon the nations in the tribulation period this is talking about, but actually this works anytime, doesn't it? When people find themselves under judgment or the threat of judgment, they tend to go and humble themselves to God, right? And so he goes on to say, verse 11 here, it says, they shall come trembling as a bird out of Egypt <laughs> and as a dove out of the land of Assyria, and I will make them to dwell in their houses, saith the Lord. Isn't that neat? Well, so it very well could be the desire of the nations because, folks, we are the body of Christ, but then there is Christ himself who lives in the body of Christ. So there's two desires here, folks. One is the body of Christ and one is Christ himself, and both of them seem to fit. Matter of fact, the next verse says in verse 8, Haggai 2 and 8, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. What is he talking about here? Well, they're building the temple. And why was he speaking about the gold? Well, I had the Lord speak to me several times this verse in um, Ezra. Let me share that with you. Ezra chapter 6 and verse 5. I asked the Lord three different times to give me a word concerning my ministry. And I just flipped the Bible up and stuck my finger down and it came on this verse. And that was within just a manner of, um, I think, a few months that this happened to me. And verse 5, Ezra 6 and 5, and it says... And also let the gold and silver vessels of the house of God. The gold and the silver is God's, right? And you know who the gold and silver vessels of the house of God is, right? It's 
God's people as they come more and more into the purity and the value of Christ, right? Gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, and brought unto Babylon to be restored and brought again unto the temple, which is at Jerusalem, every one to its place. And thou shalt put them in the house of God. God spoke this to me. Thou shalt put them in the house of God. Well, God's people have been taken captive to Babylon. They need to hear the word of God. Around the world, they need to hear the word of God. Because around the world, God's people have been taken captive to Babylonish religion, to um, secular Babylon, you know, the one world order. They've been taken captive. And now... God wants us to get the word to them that that's not where he's called them to be. Come forth out of them, my people, right? And, and here we see that the gold and silver vessels are being restored to the house of God. And he says in verse 9 of Haggai 2, The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. What? Listen. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. Well, the former glory, folks, was a physical glory, and the latter is a spiritual glory. We are the spiritual uh, sons of God. We're the spiritual Israel, right? And they were the physical Israel, you know? And uh, so, yes, we can see how the spiritual New Testament Israel around the world will be a much greater glory than that former physical parable that needed to be fulfilled, you know. So, so we see here that God is going to shake everything so that his people come out of the world, become the temple of God, and God himself will dwell in them and glorify them. That's what we see here. And I want to jump on down to verse uh, 15. And he says, And now I pray you consider from this day and backward before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. In other words, before they started building the temple, I want you to remember where you were, basically is what he's saying. In verse 16, Though all that time when one came to a heap of twenty measures, there was but ten meaning they was cursed, right? And when one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 vessels, there were but 20. And I smote you with the blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the work of your hands. Uh, yet you turned not to me, says the Lord. Consider, I pray you, from this day and backward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea. And the vine? Yeah. See, notice God had blessed them. When they started building his kingdom, building his house, which is what? His people. His people. Then he blessed them. Well, you know, when we figure out that the Great Commission wasn't just to the few, it's to all, and that in some way all of the body is uh, the body of Christ, which came to uh, fulfill the Great Commission and to preach the Great Commission. When we figure out that it's part of our work, you know, to meet the needs of our brethren, feed the Lord in our brethren, and um, then there's going to be a great provision given to God's people. You know what? We're going to need it because in the place that we're going, folks, in the coming tribulation, in the place that we're going, uh, you're going to need to be out from under the curse. You're going to need every blessing God has for you, right? Well, that's what this Haggai, this book of Haggai is all about. And the seed yet in the barn, yea, and the vine, and the fig tree, and the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not brought forth, but from this day will I bless you. Yes, because they had begun the work of the temple. He was going to bless them. 
We're going to need this blessing in the tribulation. We're going to need to be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Many natural things are going to be taken away. It's going to be, once again, the primitive church, I feel. Okay? And then he goes on to say he's going to shake heaven and earth and will overthrow the throne of kingdoms and destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Great war there in the end. And that war starts in order to preserve God's people because they're making war on the saints. And um, so God divides them as he's always divided the nations who have come against his people. And um, he's going to destroy them. And thank God because, you know, at that particular time, a great persecution against the saints. Let me read to you Psalm 41. It says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the day of evil. You know, how do we consider the poor? You know, I mean, um, are we seeking there to be equality? You know, we found that it was especially them of the household of faith that God was speaking about in our last study, that he holds them higher than the world. Even though people in the world may have a need and may ask, and you're, you need to give according to uh, Luke chapter 6, you need to give to them, you need to meet their needs, you need to be um, uh, used of God to bring them into the kingdom. And at the same time, we need to prefer the brethren, as the scripture teaches us, right? And so, blessed is he that considereth the poor, the Lord will deliver him in the day of evil. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. You know, so, you know, once we get delivered of the idea that God gets a tithe in the New Testament and we get the other 90% and we realize that we're just stewards now and that we are to use this for God's kingdom and that he desires there to be equality and so on. Once we desire those things, folks, we should be convicted that as stewards of God, we better do with what is his the way he wants it. That's why we've been given the Holy Spirit. You know they needed a tithe because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They needed to know what to do because they didn't have the individual guidance of the Holy Spirit. But we have the Spirit. And the Spirit is given to us to teach us to whom to give and where to give and, and how much and all those things. We're not under the law anymore, folks. We're under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And um, meeting the needs of people around us, listen, you can't lose by doing this. You know, you give and it'll be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Whether you're talking about giving to their spiritual needs, as we've been talking about today, or their physical needs, it makes no difference. If you give, God will give to you. And especially in the wilderness that we're about to go in, we need to store up our treasures in the kingdom of heaven, where we can get them back any time we need them, Right? He shall be blessed upon the earth, he says, and deliver not thou him unto the will of his enemies. Wow. Well, that's another provision that we are going to desperately need in the days to come. Not everybody is going to be destroyed by the beast, folks. Not everybody is going to go under the dominion of the beast at all. Matter of fact, that's why we're studying to learn to abide in the secret place of the Most High. Right, because uh, obviously some people are going to be preserved. They'll be alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. They'll be in the ark, and they won't see destruction and death. And like got Joshua and Caleb went all the way through the wilderness, which the book of Revelation tells you is a tribulation period. They went all the way through that wilderness, and uh, they entered into the promised land in their bodies. You know, and you know the rest of them died, and only their fruit entered the promised land. That's a type and a shadow. Only their children, only their fruit entered into the promised land. They didn't. They died in the wilderness. And uh, it was because of unbelief that they did this, right? And the Lord will support him on a couch of languishing 
and makest all his bed in sickness, or changest his bed in sickness. The Lord is a, a great Savior in all things, you know. And um, he's going to meet our needs in the days to come, and he wants us to give, and it'll be given unto us. He wants us to learn to sow so that we can reap. You know, the, the law that the Lord has laid down, the universal law, whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. Well, God's word cannot be broken. Whatever we want from God, we need to give. Whatever we need from God, we need to give it. We need to sow a seed, right? Now, I know you've heard lots of TV evangelists uh, use this as a gimmick to uh, get into your pocketbook, right? But, uh, you know, that's why we've got the Holy Spirit, to give us wisdom and not be caught up in those, those gimmicks and, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, it is the truth. Whatsoever man soweth, so shall he reap. You're going to receive back what you give out. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. You want to meet the needs of the brethren, you'll find out that it's going to come around the other way around one day. Matter of fact, that's exactly what um, 2 Corinthians says. I'm going to read it to you. For I say not this, that ye others may be eased and ye distressed, but by equality. Your abundance being a supply at this present time for their want, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your want, for there may be that there may be equality. As it is written, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. Glory to God. God's going to bring the church back to this equality, everybody having their needs met. And uh, praise God for that, you know. There's going to be a sense of community. God bless you. And we'll do this again sometime. Uh, be in prayer for our next uh, Bible study. God bless you. Good night. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com. 